now turn to part one. Part one. You will hear a woman calling an accommodation agency about properties to rent. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully to the first part of the conversation and answer questions one to four. Easy, Let. Good morning. How can I help you? Hello. I saw your advertisement in the paper, and I'm calling to ask about renting a flat. Certainly. What kind of flat had you in mind? Well, um, I don't know exactly. I mean, it depends on price to some extent. OK. Now, we have properties across the whole range. The average is probably £120 a week. Oh, I was hoping for something a little cheaper. They start at £90, that's the lowest we have usually, and they go up to £200. I could manage the lowest figure. An important question is how long you're thinking of staying in the property. We don't do short lets. I'd want a flat for nine months, perhaps longer. That would be fine. Our contracts are for a standard six months, and that can be extended. Fine. I'd need to come in and see you? Yes. Our office is open from 9am to 5pm. I'd need to come in on Saturday. OK, then we're here between 10am and 4pm. We also open on Sunday mornings until 1pm. Saturday is fine. If possible, I'd like to see details of some properties first. We can post you a list, or you may find it easier to look on the internet. Oh, yes. I have the address here. Thank you. Before you hear the next part of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. What else would you like to know? I wonder what I might need to buy for a flat. What's included in the rent? That depends on the flat to a certain extent, although some things are standard in all flats. For example, every flat has kitchen equipment provided for your use. Good. Does that also mean tableware, cups, glasses, plates? In some flats, but not all. OK. And bathroom towels, sheets and so on? I don't think any flats have those included. I can easily buy some. I don't suppose flats come with a TV? In fact, they all do, although they may not be the most modern models. Oh, that's fine. But it's different with the telephone. That's up to you to organise. These days, most people seem just to use their mobile phone. I can imagine. What extra charges would I get? Is heating extra? Yes, it is. But the water bill is part of the rent, so you don't have to pay for that. Right. I've noted all that. Are you looking to move into a flat soon? I hope so, yes. The thing is, we have a few flats at the moment that we'd like to get rented out by the end of the month. I see. They're all good flats, and at the price you want. There's one in Eastern Towers, one in Granby Mansions, and another in Busby Garden. All three are nice blocks of flats. Could you tell me where they are? I'm at the train station at the moment. Eastern Towers, if you're coming from the station, isn't very far. Cross over City Bridge, then go left... And where the road divides, you want the right-hand fork. You'll see Eastern Towers on the left side of the road. It's a lovely building with trees around it. That sounds nice. What about Granby Mansions? And the best way to get there from the station is probably to go down River Road and then cross over Old Bridge. The road bends to the right round the park, and if you follow along, you'll find it there on the left side. That's a great location with lovely views of the park. Very nice. And you said there was one more? Busby Garden, yes. OK, from the station, cross over City Bridge, keep going through the first crossroads until you come to the second crossroads. Busby Garden will be facing you over to the right side. It's very convenient for the shops. Fine, thank you. Well, I'll see you on Saturday.
That is the end of part one. You now have one minute to check your answers to part one. Part 2 You will hear a recorded talk giving an introduction to the historical theme park of Manham Riverport in England. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to Manham Port, where a thousand years of history are brought to life. All the family can enjoy a day out at Manham, visit our copper mine, see models of the machinery it used, have your photo taken in 19th century costume, experience at first hand how people lived at different stages throughout history, and especially how children studied, worked and played. The port of Manham is located in beautiful and peaceful countryside, on a bend in the Great River Avon, and developed here because it's the highest navigable point of the Avon. Boats can go no higher up this river, and proved a handy place to load and unload cargo to and from the sea, which is over 23 miles away. A small port was already established here when, about 900 years ago, tin was discovered nearby, though it wasn't until the Industrial Revolution, when a tremendous need for metals of all kinds developed, that Manham expanded to become one of the busiest ports in the country. And because it was already so busy, prospectors began to look for other minerals, and by the end of the 19th century, lead, copper, manganese and arsenic were added to the cargoes leaving Manham. In the early days, the ores had been smelted, or processed, in the same area they were mined. But as demand grew, the smelting process required huge factory furnaces, or fires, to melt the metal from the rock. And there was not enough coal in the local area, so the rocks containing minerals had to be shipped long distances. Sadly, in the 20th century, the great port of Manham declined, and thousands of workers were forced to emigrate out of the area. The building at the port fell into disrepair, and the place became almost forgotten. But then the Manham Trust was formed to conserve the historical resources of the area. It organised scores of local volunteers to remove undergrowth to find the original outlines of the installations. It then brought in paid professionals to match installations with maps of the original port complex and to set about reconstructing it. Today, you can see the results of this ambitious programme of restoration. The intention, and we believe this will be realised before the end of the year, is to return Manham Port to the condition it reached at its peak as the greatest copper port in the country. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. But what can you do and see on your visit today? Here are just a few highlights. We suggest you start with the visit to the copper mine. Travel on converted mining trains and journey into the depths of the mountain along seams once worked by hundreds of miners. Watch out especially for the great pumping machines which rid the mine of water. But please be warned that, like all mines, ours is very dark and closed in, and we do say that children under five, and also dogs, should not be taken into the mine. The next recommended visit is to the village school. While looking round the classrooms, take a special look at our display of games, which is one of the largest in the world. And it's recommended to time your visit to coincide with a guided tour. This will give you the opportunity to ask lots of questions. Near the school is the beautiful old sailing ketch called the George. You're welcome to board the boat and look round the cabins. Look out for the ship's wheel, which was missing until only five years ago when it was dredged out of the silt by a local fisherman. We have no idea how it got there, but it's been polished and proudly restored to its original place on the boat. Please take care going down the ladders if you wish to visit the lower deck. We don't recommend you allow young children to use them. So we hope you have a memorable visit to Manham Port and we'll tell your friends all about us. That is the end of part two. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part two. Part 3 You will hear two university students discussing their course and a project they are doing together. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen to the first part of the conversation and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Martin. Hi, Kate. How are you? Fine. I'm relieved to have done my presentation. I'm sure. How did it go? Oh, OK in the end, but I was ever so nervous beforehand. It's silly because I do know my stuff quite well. I must know those statistics inside out. But when you have to get each table of results to come up in the right order, it can make you nervous. Mm. It was my first time using the computerised projector and I was sure I was going to get the controls wrong or something. And, of course, that's not a good situation if you know you've got to listen to questions carefully and be ready to answer quickly. But it was fine once you got going? Yes. I do feel that the standard of presentations could be improved in general. I think a lot of the lecturers agree with me, although I don't honestly know what they can be expected to do about it. Students need to appreciate the difference between style and content. Too many presentations are just a mass of detailed content, all very worthy, without any attempt to engage people's interest. Basic things like looking at your audience's faces seem to get forgotten, and that makes it harder to concentrate on the points made about the research itself. Yes, there are quite a few improvements I'd like to see. Take tutorials, for example. I feel they're often a missed opportunity. I come out not feeling sure about what I've learnt. Week in, week out, I faithfully plough through the reading list, which is fair enough, but then the discussion doesn't seem to extract the main issues. It's frustrating. Mm, I know what you mean. Mind you, we have to take some responsibility ourselves. I actually got quite a lot from that skills workshop I went to on taking notes, and I'd like to make similar improvements in the next semester. Hmm... The reading list we get has several websites each time, and I want to learn to navigate my way round them more effectively. Now that sounds a good idea. Mind you, it means spending more time in the library. If you can get in. 
You mean because it's too crowded? It isn't big enough, is it? Well, I don't know. I mean, I like to work late in the evening and it shuts before I want to finish. But I know you can access the catalogue from a laptop. Which, personally, I haven't got. Actually, the problem for me is that I like to get up early and start work straight away, and they don't start until nine. I wish they'd change that. Now you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen to the rest of the conversation and answer questions 26 to 30. Look, we ought to start working out what to do next for our project. <laughs> yes, enough moaning. <laughs> OK. The main thing is to allocate the various tasks between us, isn't it? Yes. Well, we're going to need the questionnaire before we can do much else, aren't we? Do you want to handle that? I'd assumed we'd do it together. Well, you have more experience than me. Maybe you could think up the main questions, you know, a first version of the whole thing, and then I could read it through. And make suggestions? Well, OK. My experience on projects has all been with closed groups. I don't really know how you go about selecting subjects from larger populations. Actually, it's, it's quite straightforward. You use tables of randomised numbers. Could you show me? Yeah, I'll take you through the process. That way you'll learn and I'll feel surer for having someone else there. Uh, now, that brings us to the interviews themselves. Right. Would you like to do them, or are there too many? Well, your typing's pretty fast, isn't it? So, if you agree to handle the transcribing afterwards, I'm prepared to do the face-to-face -face stage. Does that sound fair? It does to me. But tell me if you find it takes longer than you thought. And vice versa. And when we get the results all together, they'll need to be run through statistics programmes, won't they? Now, that's where I always feel a bit unsure about which tests are the correct ones to choose. Same here. But we can get advice from the lecturers about that. Shall we do all that as a joint effort? I think it'd make us feel more secure about what we were doing. Yes, it would be terrible to get that wrong after all the hard work leading up to it. And then we've got to present the whole thing to the group. Will you feel up to doing that? I think we should do a joint presentation. It's all both our work, after all. Mm, I guess you're right. But would you mind getting the slides and so on ready? I find that takes me ages and still doesn't look any good. Whereas I quite enjoy that kind of thing. OK. Now, we need to think about a few... That is the end of part three. You now have 30 seconds to check your answers to part three. Part 4 You will hear part of a biology lecture about an animal called the sleepy lizard that is common in parts of Australia. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Last week we started looking at reptiles, including crocodiles and snakes. Today, I'd like us to have a look at another reptile, 
the lizard, and in particular, at some studies that have been done on a particular type of lizard whose Latin name is Teliqua rugosa. This is commonly known as the sleepy lizard because it's quite slow in its movements and spends quite a lot of its time dozing under rocks or lying in the sun. I'll start with a general description. Sleepy lizards live in Western and South Australia, where they're quite common. Unlike European lizards, which are mostly small, green and fast-moving, sleepy lizards are brown, but what's particularly distinctive about them is the colour of their tongue, which is dark blue, in contrast with the lining of their mouth, which is bright pink. And they're much bigger than most European lizards, They have quite a varied diet, including insects and even small animals, but they mostly eat plants of varying kinds. Even though they're quite large and powerful, with strong jaws that can crush beetles and snail shells, they still have quite a few predators. Large birds like cassowaries were one of the main ones in the past, but nowadays they're more likely to be caught and killed by snakes. Actually, another threat to their survival isn't a predator at all, but is man-made. Quite a large number of sleepy lizards are killed by cars when they're trying to cross highways. One study carried out by Michael Freak at Flinders University investigated the methods of navigation of these lizards. Though they move slowly, they can travel quite long distances and he found that even if they were taken some distance away from their home territory, they could usually find their way back home as long as they could see the sky. They didn't need any other landmarks on the ground. Observations of these lizards in the wild have also revealed that their mating habits are quite unusual. Unlike most animals, it seems that they're relatively monogamous returning to the same partner year after year. And the male and female also stay together for a long time, both before and after the birth of their young. It's quite interesting to think about the possible reasons for this. It could be that it's to do with protecting their young. You'd expect them to have a much better chance of survival if they have both parents around. But in fact... Observers have noted that once the babies have hatched out of their eggs, they have hardly any contact with their parents, so there's not really any evidence to support that idea. Another suggestion is based on the observation that male lizards in monogamous relationships tend to be bigger and stronger than other males. So maybe the male lizards stay around so they can give the female lizards protection from other males. But again, we're not really sure. Finally, I'd like to mention another study that involved collecting data by tracking the lizards. I was actually involved in this myself. So we caught some lizards in the wild and we developed a tiny GPS system that would allow us to track them and we fixed this onto their tails. Then we set the lizards free again and we were able to track them for 12 days and gather data, not just about their location, but even about how many steps they took during this period. One surprising thing we discovered from this is that there were far fewer meetings between lizards than we expected. It seems that they were actually trying to avoid one another. So why would that be? Well, again, we have no clear evidence, but one hypothesis is that male lizards can cause quite serious injuries to one another. So maybe this avoidance is a way of preventing this, of self-preservation, if you like, but we need to collect a lot more data before we can be sure of any of this. That is the end of part four. You now have one minute to check your answers to part four. That is the end of the listening test. In the IELTS test, you would now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.
Mastering the IELTS speaking test, a professional approach. Achieving a high score on the IELTS speaking test requires a strategic and focused approach. Here's a professional guide to optimize your preparation. Demystifying the format. Part 1. Introduce yourself and engage in a general conversation about familiar topics like hobbies, studies, or work. Part 2. You'll receive a cue card outlining a specific topic. Take one minute to prepare, then speak for two minutes, elaborating on your thoughts and experiences. Part 3. Engage in a deeper discussion related to Part 2's topic. The examiner will pose more probing questions, prompting you to analyze and express nuanced opinions. Understand the assessment criteria. Examiners evaluate your speaking based on four key areas. Fluency and coherence, the natural flow and logical connection of your ideas. Lexical resource, the breadth and accuracy of your vocabulary and grammar. Grammatical range and accuracy, your mastery of grammatical structures and their appropriate application. Pronunciation, clarity and intelligibility of your spoken English. Developing your proficiency. Immerse yourself, surround yourself with English through movies, podcasts, books, and news to improve comprehension and fluency. Enrich your vocabulary, actively learn new words and phrases relevant to anticipated IELTS topics. Utilize flashcards, vocabulary apps, or thematic lists. Sharpen your grammar, practice dialogue.